Linux OTC, episode 33. And no, I am not Bill, as you might well have been able to tell. I'm Majid, and who else is here? Eric's here. I'm Leo. Excellent. So, this is a bit weird, isn't it, doing, like, Bill's baby without Bill? Do you know what I mean? When when the boss is away, man. Uh, yeah, when the boss yeah, is away, yeah. the kids will play. That's yeah, right. I considered making, like, an AI clone of his voice, you know, so that we could uh, get oh, him to say some, come on. some terrible things. Uh, Eric, <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, but know, yeah know, you know what we could have had? We could have had, like, one of those kind of soundboard things, you know, oh. with, like, with, like, different mm-hmm. phrases. That you yeah, know, he would yeah, say, yeah. you know, um, I remember the first one I ever saw of that was a Terminator 2 one. And there was like little phrases of, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, uh, you know, look at, you know, come with me if you want to live. Yeah. You know? Listen, if uh, if you guys give me uh, a little bit of time after the show, I think I'll go through some of the old episodes and bring in all the Bill stuff. <laughs> but you have to come into Discord. You can put them in Discord. Um, Discord will do a whole soundboard for you. So like in the bottom left in a in a video chat. Um, and it's got all kinds of stuff, man. You can bring in whatever you want. Oh yeah, uh, I think I we guess. did this once. I think we did uh-huh. this once on a uh-huh. on a round table, and I think I I think I took delight in interrupting Moss at every possible opportunity, oh, which is man. always yeah. an entertaining yeah. entertaining thing to do. Oh man, throws the guy off. Yeah, it's that, so funny. That is that is the fun part is that you know you can't stop other people from just spamming it. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of Discord love going on, hey? I mean, this sounds like a cool thing. And you were saying just before the show about Discord bots. Oh, yeah. So uh, so Bill does. Uh, we each do our own recording of our own audio, right? And that's the highest quality. But Bill also does a recording of our stuff, backs up all of our stuff. So we were talking about, well, how do we not screw this up? And uh, I remembered that there's a bot that I use for Linux user space uh, as a backup backup, right? We have a gajillion backups uh, when we record that show. And Craig, a Discord bot, is one of those backups. And it's just a Discord bot that you invite to your voice channel whenever you're in Discord. uh, And it records everybody's voice, one uh, individually, right? So there'll be a Majid track, an Eric track, and a Leo track at the end of this. uh, Or you could download it all mucks together if you want. Um, But right, I mean, it's a fairly decent quality backup recording uh, just that you can get into Discord. And I just, uh, in a different channel, I added a music box. There's a, uh, so basically you just do like comma play. I think it's called Matchbox. You do comma play and then a link to the song you want it to play. And in the voice channel, it'll just play that music. So, I mean. Which I, service I really, is it using? Uh, it uses whichever service you point it to. Okay. And it will use the premium version of those services if you want it to. Oh, nice. Um, I mean, yeah. So do it. it, it is the this proliferation is, yeah. of Discord bots something that is it because they make it easy to create them? Is it free to use their API? Do you, you have any insight into into why it's such a powerful system? Or it's because I think, I think of like, sorry, I, I think about this recording, right? And you said, okay, you can mux it and have one large recording, which would be probably pretty easy to do because it's just recording whatever's happening in the channel. The idea that it can get separate recordings means that somehow. It's able it's to AI. That's what it is. Well, it's AI. Well, no, no, no. I, it's probably like an API thing, right? Where it's able to <laughs> somehow get a stream for each one of those separately. Yep. So that's kind of cool. Yep, yep, yep. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how it's put together, but as far as why there's so much, I mean, if you go to, I think it's like, um, oh, I forget, Discord dot top or something like that. There's, it's just an insane amount of software in there that works just directly in Discord, right? I think at this point, uh, Discord probably has a wider software selection than Linux does. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, just, that's a statement ooh. in a half, I, mean, yeah, just, wow. I uh-huh. mean, look, the, the audio recorder on Discord actually works. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, my goodness. Well, let's see. That's, a, that's an interesting that, way to start. Yeah, that, that's five like minutes really, in. <laughs> yeah, I, extremely uncontroversial way to start a podcast, yeah? About all, all I'm saying, <laughs> all I'm saying is, I think Discord has a huge amount of software built directly for it because there's a huge amount of people that use Discord on a day to day. And you know the 
a small sliver, a small contingent of those users That's happen true. to also be nerds that, yeah. that would put software together mm. like this. That's true. And also, if you think about it, the idea of a bot being like a Linux application or a Unix application where it's solving one problem, right? Yep. Uh, it might be more complicated than that, but the idea is that there was a problem that someone had or wanted a feature that yeah. didn't exist and they were able to create it. And that unitasker approach of like, let's make this one thing that it does work really well. Yeah. Like uh, you were saying that Craig, this bot that's recording us is you can use it for free and you get a certain number of formats and features. But if you want to get you know, a more extended set or more capabilities than you pay for it. And that's also sort of in keeping with how open source generally works is like you get, you know, so much of something and then you can, or, or that, I guess it's less open source and more sort of a shareware. You call that model. Yeah. Shareware sort shareware. of thing. Shareware. Yeah. This, this goes oh, all yeah. the way back to the nineties and the eighties when we're talking mm. about older software that, yeah. um, you know, public think- domain software that we used to call it. And freeware yeah. and well, shareware, as you say, yeah. <laughs> like WinRAR still has that aura of the yeah. best software of all time because you didn't have to pay for it, right? And then now, like it was sometime earlier in the year, maybe last year, where WinRAR went on this streak of people just paying for it. They don't even use it anymore. All the functionality is built into Windows or Linux or whatever. And right. so people don't don't use WinRAR like they used to. But yet somehow they were able to get um they were able to get you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in people buying licenses for winrar and it was funny cuz on twitter it was it was basically uh, i don't even use this software anymore but here you go here's your here's your license it, fee because i used it almost like a joke mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i mean yeah. i mean i suppose i suppose it's because people have a workflow or whatever and so they just get all you know so like you know you get used to using a particular application program well, but, or whatever but, but and then a even file. I mean, roaring a f- file back in the day was so important because I mean, you c- you had to split things across. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Storage because th- you know the you'd have something that was too big for the medium, like a like a f- disk, a floppy disk, a floppy, a, a zip drive. Remember zip drives? Yeah, I always yeah. I used roars with zip drives a lot because you yeah. could break it into what was it, hundred megabyte chunks, hundred megabyte two fifty. I think that was like yep. the size of the something the, like that. The, yeah, the disks. And so, yeah, you had something that was a gigabyte and you'd have to break it into four pieces or something. To, and a RAR file was awesome for that. And yeah, yep. how do you do it? WinRAR. <laughs> it, exactly. I think, and then 7-Zip came on the scene and just kind of, uh, yeah. if if you were Ate technical enough, because yeah. 7-Zip wasn't an easy utility to use. It, uh, mm. WinRAR was definitely easier to use. Yeah. Um, but I think if you were technically apt enough, you just kind of left WinRAR in the dust and used 7-Zip because it had better compression. Uh, it had faster decompression a lot of times. And anything beat Zip. So, you know, there was that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Zip wasn't built in, right? If, if you think yeah, back. yeah, yeah. You had to, uh, it had to be something you had to go find and figure out how to do. And, you yep. know, in the same way that like, PDFs, remember, originally, you know, if you wanted to, you had to have a specific Ugh. PDF viewer. Adobe. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yep. And, um, you know, the, all that sort of thing. So, I mean, you know, we've, we've gone so far along, but then we've all got this kind of memory of how to use a computer and ideas of how to use a specific application well, or whatever. And so we kind of just go back to that, you know, even if, you know, there is something newer or better out, you know, you're just like, well, I know how this works. So I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. The idea that you had to... So to Leo's point, most of this stuff is just built in now to whatever operating system you're using, especially basic utilities like compression. You know, it's just part of a file manager. It's expected to be there. Like now, if you had to go get something like 7-Zipper, it would seem odd, you know, to have to take that yeah. extra step. But back in the day, to your point, Majid, like it's, you know, you had to put thought into like, oh, I don't have a PDF reader. I don't have, a, you know, these basic sets of, of utilities that almost everything comes with now. And I think that also sort of speaks to there used to be ample sort of opportunity for smaller software vendors to come in and solve problems. Whereas, you know, mm-hmm. and, and Apple is famous for this for, you know, there's some company that builds some feature that everybody sort of likes. And then all of a sudden Apple's like, Hmm, why don't we just put that right into the operating system? And that's yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. then that yeah. software vendors like, Hmm, <laughs> I guess we're, 
our business model's just been crushed by Apple. So yeah, hey, hold on. It. You, you can't just yeah, blame Apple, just Apple for this. Oh, no, uh, it's everybody. I, I, I mean, G G Google do it very much with Android, isn't it? So many of the features which are now baked into stock Android now were things that were either they were apps or they were done by custom skins or they were custom ROMs or, you know, as time went on. And same with Windows and with yeah. Linux as well. So, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's just, yeah, the way the world has gone. That so is that just things. evolution, like progression of the software, of the operating I, systems, or I is that cherry so. picking? I don't know, man. Both, I, I, was, I, thought, I, thought, I would have thought a bit of both, because obviously, if you are a multi-billion dollar company, you'd want to make money, and so you'd want your stuff to be easily usable, as it were. Well, what's the and, more ethical thing, though, to buy the company that produced it and then fold their functionality in or to just nope. basically outcompete them? No, neither, man, is to collaborate with them and uh, and have a symbiotic relationship. I think what's happened is the companies that work right now that end up gobbling up all these other companies uh, tend to do tend to work or manage their software in that direction as well. And I think it's bad for the ecosystem because you you end up with you know a mono a monoculture, right? I mean, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, with the, the monopoly, reason. basically, isn't it? It's like what we've this, how we've ended up with a, a duopoly in in mobile, you know, where it's just you remember what. 10, 15 years ago, you know, there was Windows Mobile, there was Firefox OS. Windows Mobile Firefox. was good. I actually like yeah. Windows Mobile as well, actually. Windows Phone. Sorry. I actually liked Windows Phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I mean, it, and, and, they, and now they finally... Go ahead. Yeah, and I was saying, <clears> and now, you know, we've ended up with this duopoly because, yeah, you know, a lot of the other, you know, the uh, more innovative or the interesting ideas were just taken up. Either they were, you know... Uh, you know, either companies bought other companies or they just rip them off or whatever it might be. And, you know, once you get people in a, uh, you, again, once you get people used into an ecosystem, used into a workflow, you know, it's very difficult to change, uh, you know, things. So, for example, I've got a friend of mine who is, um, he runs this uh, free plug for him. He runs an Instagram thing called Muslim Bikers. I, th I, I make the joke that this is his midlife crisis. You know, he, you know, I, you know, I hit 40 something and I did whatever he hit 40 and he got a Harley Davidson. Do you know what I mean? Um, and learn how to drive motorbikes. But anyway, and it, it's quite cool and stuff. And um, he was telling me, you know what, I, I've been on Android since the beginning, um, but I'm thinking of moving over to iPhone because because uh, of some of the content that we do. Yes, we have a proper mirrorless camera that, you know, we, we get video shots with, but you know, I, I want to, you know, if I do want to get, um, you know, kind of more off the cuff stuff just to put up on Instagram or uh, things like that, then, you know, uh, I've heard that the iPhone's cameras, um, you know, the videos anyway of it is supposed to be really good. But I don't know. I mean, I've got 15 years of being on one platform and I can't be bothered to rebuy all my apps and this that and the other, it might, which it might be. And it made me think, you know, that that is something, isn't it? It's, you know, you are so many people use a lot of the technology that we love and tinkering with because we're nerds, but they use it as appliances and they use it as, yeah. you know, I want to get a job done and how do I get the job done? And then after a while, you know, familiarity is what, you know, is uh, what people want. Um, I actually told him to get a Pixel 8 Pro because I said, you know, you'll get good videos and you'll get good pictures. And, and you have to reboot it every couple of days because the battery life is being <laughs> janked for some reason and no one knows why. Yeah, I, I do find it odd, actually, that <laughs> Google, the software company, has had quite a lot of problems on the software side, on the devices that it makes from beginning to end. Yeah. You know, I remember when the Pixel 6 came out and the 6 Pro specifically, there were loads of issues around battery drain and uh, low cellular connectivity and crap fingerprints, you know, scanners. And you're kind of like, okay, but you, like, you know, you control everything. You know, you're doing an Apple here, you know, controlling the hardware stack, controlling the software. How has it you've managed to, like, make it a bit crap? I don't exactly yeah. understand. I didn't exactly understand. But anyway, apparently things have got better on that, on that front. Well, yeah, I mean, what they've basically ended up with, I mean, at this point, I've had two pixels in a row, and I'm pretty much stuck because I really enjoy the features that they have in terms of, you know, call screening and on-device uh, AI type stuff and the voice recognition modeling and, and on-device is, is excellent. Like all of the stuff that I use on a day-to-day -day basis 
is really refined at this point. I mean, to your point, yes, there were definitely growing pains and a lot of things that were suboptimal to say the least. But I really feel like Google's stepped up and the Pixel devices are, you know, they're a pretty complete package at this point. And they keep adding, you know, useful features, which is surprising for Google, considering that they usually don't stand behind something and continue to like really push it forward. Um, oh, don't worry. The Pixel line's done pixel. in a couple of years. Don't worry. They'll kill yeah, it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they you will. Reckon? I'm sure you they'll reckon? they'll figure out. You reckon? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's I don't know that they're actually making back what they're putting into it. Yeah. I have to imagine that they're they're spending a lot of money on R and D and that's that's um, everything from Google that isn't cloud or search with ads, right? That's it. That's that's uh, an email. Sorry, email, of course. But those are it, man. Um, so then what is then, it? So what? Because one of the things that was when they had the Nexus program, there was a thing about okay, this is like for developers and. This is for, um, you know, showcasing what, you know, the latest and greatest of Android can do. And then when they started off with the pixels, it was a case of, okay, well, this is us being able to make a model device, as it were. You know, this hey, is... The, it, it was I, them trying to do the Apple thing, and uh, they've tried and tried and tried. I don't know that they've ever succeeded to the level of, like, hardware software integration that Apple has. But they've done a decent job, I think. You know, and then, you know, now, you know, says, you know, since Pixel 6, it's been, you know, now they actually have their own chips in there, you know, with the Tensor um, and think, you know, whilst right. they were using ones before. So, I mean, I I don't know how much of a market share Pixels have. Uh, That's what I, I was I, just going to look yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I oh, you know be, Samsung's on top by a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. But what I'm trying to say is that I just, I can't, I just find it very hard to believe that they'll completely can the whole thing. I think they would still keep some, you know, they'll keep it going. If nothing else, to keep their toe in that water, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I just, They're I, just I, hoping Samsung does something stupid. <laughs> mm, I don't think so, because actually, at the end, it, it's like, um, you know, the big irony about all these things is, you know, the competitors are often what makes them a huge amount of money. You know, Apple and Google services on iOS make Google a huge amount of money. Yeah. You know, oh, um, no, they're never going to stop that. Story. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That, that, it, Exactly. So similarly with Samsung, you know, if Samsung is uh, and, you know, it has been, yes, it might be up and down, but it has always been the largest Android phone maker, you know, consistently for over the last decade or so, then why would they not work with them? And, you know, you saw like, you know, with the S24 Galaxy AI, I mean, Galaxy AI is just basically Google's AI, just rebranded by Samsung. Wear yeah. OS, you know, comes first to Samsung devices, you know, uh, to the detriment of others. And, you know, you, you're seeing, you know, a lot of players moving out of that space, you know, Fossil and, you know, who used to make Wear OS devices. Now they don't anymore because Google gives preferentially stuff to Samsung. So, you know, um, I don't think they're ever going to, I think if any of them really think that they're going to now build the next iPhone or S series, Galaxy S with a pixel and get that market share, market share. And they, you know, they're being incredibly naive at best. Yeah. Or well, let me, stupid, <clears throat> let me, you know. let me read. So this is an article from Statista. I've never heard of the site, but it's uh, statista.com. And basically it's the title, Google remains a niche player in the smartphone market. And I'll just read a couple of selections here. Having worked with various hardware makers before Google debuted the made by Google Pixel smartphones in 2016. But despite good reviews and attractive price points, the company never really cracked the smartphone market, selling just a fraction of the devices market leaders Samsung, Apple, and Xiaomi have um, moved year after year. According to... Our consumer insights, Google remains a niche player uh, with less than 5% of smartphone users calling a Google device their main phone in most major markets. So in the Canada and U.S., they're using used by 55 and 4.5% of smartphone uh, users, respectively. Uh, and that is, according to Google estimates, they shipped 2.6 million smartphones in North America in the first half of 2023, while market leader Apple shipped 35 million. Yeah. So, so 2.6 to, to 35 million. So yeah, it's, you know, they, to Leo's point, I mean, they, I just don't think that they are, it, it's 2016 to now. So that's you know, eight year run. Um, how long will they let that go being, you no, know, I mean, so look, this, at, look so, at Windows. So, so Windows 
Yeah, so obviously that's not, that can't be their play. The, you know, as I said, it must be, it would be incredibly naive of, the, of them to, to think that they would become the next Apple or next Samsung when it comes to uh, phone shipment sales. So there must be another reason. So this what, what, what are they, about, exactly, what are they getting? Is it, if well, it's not? They're, they're, getting, they're getting a Linux sized market share. What's funny about that is that 8% of half of the devices, right? Like, so Android is about half of the market, right? Yeah. And 8% of that half is 4% of the total market. What is Linux's market share? Good point. Good point. I'm just saying that. So they're 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 yeah. live. That's cool. And yeah. in in some ways they work better. I guess. I, but yeah. I, I, mean, it, I, I, I suppose it's a way of them showcasing what can be done. You know, and be having yeah. a having a reference device. I suppose is always helpful. I think that's it, right? It, it's a reference device so that other people can pick and choose and copy and, and do stuff like that. But uh, do they? I mean, I feel like Samsung. Mm, I mean, you do get. I'll tell I you mean, what. I, I mean, okay, Samsung skin is you know um, different, oh, right? I hated uh, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I never liked it when it was touch yeah. with. It's better when it's now that it's one UI. The one UI uh, yeah, I'm looking at, uh, like a lot better. Yeah. But if you look at some of the other, you know, smaller players, if you want to talk about it, you know, nothing phone, Motorola to an extent, um, you know, their Android skins are not that different from stock. You know, yeah. OnePlus for a long time, Oxygen OS wasn't that much different from stock. Okay, now it's a bit more different because of the um, the closer integration they have with Oppo. And even uh, Xiaomi, whose MIUI is as close as you could get in the Android wor world to an iOS clone, even that has, you know, a lot more Google in it now than it did five, six years ago. You know, the Google right. Discover feed and some of the, uh, the, you know, other kind of multitasking features and but stuff Google, like that. But Google being uh, underpinning their systems is helpful in a lot of ways. Their ability to push updates in a way that carriers haven't been able to previously, mm -hmm. um, you know, having access to sort of more of the core system to your point. Like at this point, really, I feel like it's window dressing more than anything in a lot of mm. cases. I mean, Samsung does do a lot with one UI and they they obviously, but it's, it's kind of funny to, to look at a Samsung phone though, because usually there's a lot of duplication, like there's two calendar apps, mm -hmm. like, you know, okay. uh, I, I want to tie this back into the conversation we were having before about, uh, discord apps and then doing one thing really well. And yeah. Eric, that's what you were talking about. And I was going to quit back then, uh, that, that means that you're a gnome user then. I am. Okay, good. Because uh, that's that's their huge thing, and I think KDE is finally, finally following along with that, uh, with I guess with that line of thinking where instead of having these big mammoth apps that that do nine hundred different things or whatever, um, you have the one. So there's that thread to go down, but also there's uh, you were talking about Majid. You were talking about the tensor chips in the in the Google phones. Mm -hmm. um, we now have, uh, so how we have Raspberry Pi devices, we have ARM chips uh, that we can use to run Linux on. But there's also another device by uh, RADXA, I don't know how to pronounce that, Radza, Rag, whatever, X4, and it's got an Intel N100 Celeron chip on it, and it's in the same form factor as a Raspberry Pi, which means that Raspberry Pi hats will work on it. It, uh, Raspberry Pi cases will work on it. It's powered over USB C. It's got micro HDMI. It it is a direct competitor at the same price, sixty bucks, mm -hmm. as a uh, Raspberry Pi five. So pick your thread. Which one are we going down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I suppose you could say One UI is the KDE of Android. I suppose in one sense, the yeah. you know the huge number of options that you get the th number of it can, it can be very powerful you know i've recently discovered floating windows and having three apps open at the same time which oh but something y'all said uh majid was it you that said that uh, it's just window dressing or was that you eric no i think yeah 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 I, and I, 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 I do think there's functionality underneath right that if you are a inverted commas power user right you yeah. you might like I think the thing is that maybe a lot of them are finding is that not the general public don't necessarily do all that sort of stuff. Maybe nerds like me like to have, you know, YouTube running while I'm, you know, WhatsApping somebody and at the same time checking my 
I don't check Twitter anymore. My Mastodon feed, you know, um, all on my phone. <laughs> Maybe I'm, you know, because I'm a nerd and I do that sort of stuff. Maybe normal people don't do that sort of stuff. But I can do that with One UI. And I'm sure I could probably do it on other ones. Um, Pixel is a lot more Gnome-y, I would say. And that's not a bad thing because I actually use Gnome on my uh, yeah. on my laptops. But yeah, if you were going to make any kind of... Um, uh similarities and you know say that this is similar to this this is the yeah this is the kde of this world or this is the gnome of this world um i think that but it, um you know but it's all window that, dressing it's all window dressing and it doesn't matter well mm. to some extent because there is yeah. there's functionality i'm not 100 percent sure about that actually. for the power yeah. users it might because you might yeah. pull the curtain back and look at those features but for that's a yeah. m- massive amount of people that don't care it's just window dressing Right. And mm-hmm. it's the reason that I find it very difficult to personally use an iOS device because I find that the limitations are difficult for me because I try to do things that go against what Apple is providing. And yeah, that's because I'm not their typical user. Like yeah. my, I went home to visit my family for the first <clears throat> time in, in quite a while. And it was amazing how literally everyone uses an iPhone. Yeah, because they go with the flow. They have a good time using their device. They don't fight it. Well, but I don't feel like I fight my phone. And I feel (laughs) like I do fight. If you're on an iPhone, you would. Yeah. I would fight an iPhone. And that's what's so funny. Whenever whenever I've had iPads and MacBooks, I just end up fighting the operating system so hard. Right. But it's the other way around for most normal people. Yeah. Yeah. Just take it easy. (laughs) But it goes back to like Majid and I were talking about like wedding planning and, 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 you know, I got to a point where we were just sort of having this, you know, analysis paralysis and decision fatigue and stuff. And we ended up going with a company that was a, a wedding planning service and they basically just gave us choices and they said, okay, here's this choice to make, here's this choice. And they broke it down into little pieces that made it much easier to deal with. And I think that's what makes Apple so appealing to non-technical yep. users is there are only so many things you can do and only so many ways you can do them. And, you know, it, it makes it, simpler to just use a device but i want to i want to say something about um you said it makes it appealing to non-technical users but it also makes it appealing to technical users too george castro just came out with a video talking about uh the asus guys the asus raw ally the little handheld Mm -hmm. thing right yeah these guys internally are now using bazite instead of steam os or any other kind of um platform to run their games on and the main thing the main takeaway for that is that technical users don't want to make those ch- those choices either. That's the thing, right? Like there are a c- there is a get- contingent. I, no, I I think just by default. I think more of the technical users are also I don't care about that, just make it work. Because just because they're technical does not mean that they like to pop the hood and and start tinkering yeah. underneath. There is a small contingent mm. of people that are tinkerers and that is perfectly fine. But when you have a technical user that wants to get work done that isn't tinkering, then you're going to also find that those people also want a solution that is opinionated and they don't want to think about those types of those types of uh choices, right? So even if you're a wedding planner you would still hire a different wedding planner to do the work because you don't want to deal with it. That, I think, is something that is huge in Linux. And George, I mean, I don't know that he proved it, but I think he's finally opening up that conversation of one that says, you know, there are technical users that don't care either. So true, maybe... True. I mean, a bit, but, but that's, I mean that assumes... that's just a variety of the people, isn't it? Everybody's different. and Sure. But, and I, there I, are I, tinkerers, I, sure. Yeah, I, and I suppose, you know, maybe we're being a little bit too... Um, broad strokes and saying that there's normies and techies there's lots of different there's lots it's a continuum yeah. isn't it you know there's yeah. lots of different types of people and you know there are people that would are just i mean this was actually a discussion on um late night linux where oh, i can't remember who it was i think yeah, it was joe ressington he probably started the conversation saying that you know I, he started to come across more and more people who you know, after years and years of using Linux and whatever, they've just finally got a bit tired and they've just gone, you know what, I'm just going to go to Mac because I just can't be bothered anymore. Yeah. They won't go back, they won't go to Windows because they know all the problems. And, um, and you know, they started saying, you know, like he goes like, I haven't got one, but another, I know a couple of other people on the show, you know, they also run 
a Mac OS install in some way. You know, they've got, a I don't know, a MacBook Air or they've got a whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, a couple of the guys were like, yeah, I think after a certain amount of time, you know, you do start losing a bit of patience and you do kind of want, I just want to get something done. And I can see that. In, but then it's interesting how none of those, even then, have fully gone over. You know, you don't get people who kind of, okay, that's it. I'm just hood winked, you know, you know, a hook, line and sinker. I'm going to convert and become an Apple person and I'm going to yeah. throw out everything else and I'm just going to go fully invested into the ecosystem. You no, because don't find, I, I think... you, you, you don't find many people who make that decision, apart from the fact that it's expensive to do. Um, you just don't because, yeah, so, they, so therefore, again, going to the point that you were mentioning about um, having a tool that does a specific job mm. and does that well, that maybe for, for the technical inverted commas users, you get some who say, okay, for, I, you know, I like Linux and this, that, and this, but for this one thing, I really need to get this done properly. And so for that, I've got a MacBook Air, which I do yeah. that thing on, the, but the then I do other and... things on something else. Yeah, the tool in that uh, specific case is the desktop. So mm. Linux hasn't cracked it yet. And I think George is probably the closest. George and his group are probably the closest to doing it. Um, just simply because, like, it's it's not that GNOME is bad or KDE is bad. I think it's the the whole package. Like, GNOME comes packaged with everything else that comes in with the operating system and making that a um, a very palatable experience out of the box is, is extremely huge. It's why I hated Fedora for the longest time. Like, I do not want to go and do RPM Fusion and have to roll that into the operating right. system and then have to update a True. totally separate repository that's not, you know, okay, but, that's yeah, why but Ubuntu the, was appealing. But, yeah, that's the operating system, isn't it? That's not the desktop, is it? No, no, right. But what I'm saying is that the only thing that people that want to get work done interact with is the desktop. But the yeah. underlying bits, when you make those decisions and you make good decisions on behalf of the people that will be using your desktop, that is the thing that's going to pull them in and keep them as opposed to, you know, saying, well, here, here's Ubuntu, uh, you know, but it doesn't. It doesn't bring in the technical bits. You still have to go cobble that together. So there is a contingent of, of technical users that want something like because Gnome is because no, because Gnome is quite opinionated. Let's be honest. Gnome the but there's a KDE is, one too that works in the same in the same right. vein. It's a technical itch that you need to scratch that you don't want to have to mess with, and you can just choose KDE if you want. So it's not. I've it's spent not a lot of time. GNOME. I've spent a lot of time with uh, immutable composable, whatever you want to call it at, at this point, uh, using specifically Bluefin and some of, some of the other ones. And they're close. The tool sets are not quite robust enough yet. Like DistroBox is not uh, the answer to not ever being able to install native software. Like it, you still have to layer some things, in my case at least. And I think what, what's going to happen is that, that thankfully people like George and others are really sort of pushing the boundaries and, and moving the state of the art forward. And I think the tool sets are going to become better and more robust to the point where we don't have to worry about, you know, layering because that's still the biggest problem, right? If you have, if you're using one of those systems and you have a specific need, you have to layer a package and then it just makes, it adds a ton of complexity and it becomes a real pain in the ass to deal with. Every time you install something, you know, you're, you're re-imaging it, it. It's, it's not ideal, <clears throat> and I, of which, course, which is again, why you don't go down that avenue. You never go down that avenue. I think you that's have to. One of the you have no, to. you don't. No, you don't. Yes, you do. The, no, yes, you do. Here's yes, the thing about you do, Leo. I've spent months playing with these systems. What software? You launcher? Any but kind of can... virtualization software? I'm not any saying kind of, that it's any not... kind of system. Something that needs to be tied to the system and get to config files. Anything that can't be run in a container because it doesn't function in the hardware space is because it's not able to access homeward, the hardware though. that it needs to. All of those things exist. They are problems that need to be solved. They will be solved, but they are not solved yet. So to, huh. to so contend I'm... that someone can just run Bazite and just never have to change anything is, is kind of, is kind of silly. But also, so, so two threads I want to, I want to touch on there, right? Like I, I'm talking about the people that don't care. You're a tinkerer. There are I'm people not. that, that I'm, I, I adding... a, I'm not a tinker. I have a ses, I have a set of tools that I use, right? 
and I layer those on top of whatever system right. I'm, I'm happen in to be using. Instead of going with the flow of the system that you're using and using the the search things what that might be built that? into. Why, why would I deny myself the something that I need to to do what I need to do because it's not part of someone else's ideal? That's that, right. I, that's... What, what I'm what I'm getting at though is like this is why you don't get along with iOS. Like there's a there's a perfectly fine search in kde plasma if you go that route with it uh gnome search can be better but there there are tools that are there that will help you get everything that you need but you're tied to you launcher it is something that you use that you're used to that you like and if it's not present on the system you will make it present on the system and if there's any friction making it present on the system that system is not good for you Right. That's that's what I'm saying. Like instead of using the tools right. that are presented to you and fair play, that's fine. You can do that. And that will not be a good system for you. I'm just saying that there's a huge contingent of people that don't care that will flop that system on uh, on their on their laptop and they will get on with it just fine. It has all the tools that they need. If they can't get it through DistroBox, they'll get it through Homebrew. If they can't get it through Homebrew, they'll get it through Flatpak. If they can't get it through Flatpak, they'll find some other way to do it. Right. Or they just won't deal with it, right? And right. I think that that might be the delineation, right? Yeah. If I, I can't get it on the system, I don't care. Yeah, but then I think what you've uh, illustrated there is the the power of Linux, in a sense, sure. to be able to do those things if and when you want to, right? That um, sure. Yeah. So, like compared to iOS or Mac OS, as I said, when I had my, whenever I've had my uh, experiments into that, in that the amount of work that's required to do things that you are used to in your personal workflow or the way that you want to do it is so much that you think to yourself, oh, I can't, I just can't use this. Whilst at least in Linux, right, you can change things up a bit. You can make things work. You know, yes, it might be more work than using the uh, tools that are already within the launcher, you know, or within the desktop, mm -hmm. but you can do it. In iOS, it seems... The but you probably still can in macOS, you probably still can, but the amount of effort required makes you think, forget this, I'm just not going to use the use it at all. Well, I, that's that's not necessarily true. The the effort is really just in dollar amount, like the tools are there and right. they're easily installable with like two clicks, but it costs $3.99. And I think a lot of people that come from the Linux community are just philosophically opposed to paying for their software. Um, you know, they say they won't. But when's the last time they actually put money to an open source project, right? Like, no, I, I don't disagree. And that's, that has always been one of Linux's huge Achilles heels is that, you know, people are just cheap and they, they have this mindset that they refuse to pay for anything. Not only will they not pay for anything, they won't give up analytics. You know, they won't. Right. This there's is nothing. This is there's Adora's. nothing they will do to make life easier for the developers. Right. So. True. But then I do think that, you know, um, okay. Payments in an app store, you know, if that's something that's easily measurable, right? And you can say that, look, this is how much money is being spent on this app or these tools or whatever. Lots of people support projects, you know, through Patreon, through PayPal. Do they? They, right, right, right. Yeah. Do they? <clears throat> yeah. I would say more than I would say more than you think. Yeah. I would say more than you think. Now, is there enough? Probably not. Is it good right. enough for the uh, developers who are developing? Probably not. Are they going to be able to make a living on it? Probably not. But the, my point is that it's difficult to quantify that, isn't it? Because you have to get that information from the specific developer or the specific foundation. And only then would you know. And most people don't release that sort of stuff because it's a private stuff. You know, why, why do you want the whole world to know how much money you're making through Patreon? You wouldn't, would you? So I, I'm just saying that it's, it, it's, much, it's more difficult to quantify how much support people are getting because it's somewhere else. Do you see what I mean? Well, I, I, I don't agree. know. I, yeah, I agree with you that it's not as much uh, as it should be. And you're right. People are cheap and some people are philosophically but against it. And some people are just that. monetarily. But there are, I mean, you know, we've, we've all got projects that we all contribute to, I'm sure. You know, yeah, it's more than that. Though, it's, it. to, to Leo's point, uh, yeah, P some people can't afford it, but they can afford to go spend ten dollars on a cup of coffee from Starbucks. I mean, no, no, no. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, yeah, you know, no. I'm um, just saying. Yes, there are certainly a contingent of people that are literally just 
impoverished and not able to contribute. Sure, right. And then, yeah. you know, people could say, well, then you can contribute your time. The, the point is that open source works because a very small few number of people actually either put in the, t the time and effort to develop the software, right, test right, it, right. whatever, support it in some way, or financially back something, whereas the lion's share of users don't do any of that and never will. And so, <clears throat> and that's fine. You know, it is what it is because I think there's enough of a value and enough, um, you know, use usefulness out of like developers scratch their own itch, right? That's what open source is all about. Usually is that they have some need, they find a way to fill the need. And it just so happens that the rest of us benefit because of it. Uh, you know, the more altruistic ones will actually take your needs into account and then incorporate it into their software. Great. You know, but at the end of the day, like to Leo's point, when I've used Mac OS, the idea of paying three or four dollars for a piece of software or twenty dollars or whatever it is, sometimes, yeah, is, it, it's not just like I think of like I, I had switched and I needed an FTP client. Well, I used, you know, I can't remember which one it was now, but it was the oh. most wonderful piece of software I think I've ever used. And it was, was like it Cyber $15. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't Cyberduck. That, that's Dude. open source. There was another one. Dude, oh no no. Oh well yeah. So Cyberduck is is like fully free and everything, but you should pay for Cyberduck. If you use Windows, if you use like SFTP or anything on Windows or on Mac. This is just me loving on Cyberduck cuz I love that software. Um cuz I'll use Windows, Mac and Linux, right? Linux it's all built in. It yeah. doesn't matter. I don't need that. But for Windows and Mac to make it easy and uh not have to deal with like uh the uh, FileZilla blowing my eyeballs out every time I open it up on Windows, um <laughs> I just I just use Cyberduck. And dude, um, yeah, I got me a license. Yeah, you don't have to. It it does everything. You don't have to get a license for Cyberduck. But what was it like, ten or fifteen bucks? And it was yeah. oh, it was worth every penny. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. So I used Forklift, and that and Forklift is twenty dollars ah. for a single user, and it is because it is so Mac specific, right? It 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 builds ah. itself into Finder. It hooks itself into Mac, and it is so Cyberduck. It works. But it never had that level of integration and level right. of sort of polish. Whereas for twenty dollars, I had uh, Forklift, and it was truly, Whoa. you know, because I had been using FileZilla as well. Um, and yeah, Forklift was just like a revelation because it was like okay. And I I tend to think of things like I just mentioned the cup of coffee from Starbucks. Like I tend to think of things in terms of value in that respect. Like what day to day dumb frivolous things am i doing that cost me money that i don't even think about because it's just something i do that that twenty dollars is basically two cups of three cups of coffee right mm -hmm. yeah. and i can use that software because it's a license and not a subscription i can actually just keep using it for as long as i want to use it i'm not forced to update it or change it and the value i get from that twenty dollars is uh, is amazing and so, yeah, I agree with you, though. Most people, when they come to Mac, they just say, well, what's the free version? Oh, FileZilla. Okay, yeah. I'll just use File. Or I'll, they'll use a lesser optimized solution simply because it's free or, you know, open source. And, th and those are fine ideals if, if that's what you hold true. But, I mean, you, you're right. You do have to sort of go with the flow. And on Mac OS, you have to sort of do right. things the way that they have it done. And if you want to have a good experience... You're gonna probably have to pay for some software. Yeah. Heaven forbid. <laughs> yeah. But those yeah. those composable systems are a lot like that, I think. If you go yeah. with the flow, I mean, because they give you they give you a, a terminal that's just way over engineered for what most people need. But um, yeah. you know, use vanilla like, really OS, take have advantage. With, have you played Which? with vanilla OS? Uh not the, vanilla. The new no. beta. Uh -uh. Orchid is coming out tomorrow, I think. It's their oh. the version two. Uh, it's it's a super super nice system. It's very polished, um, and if you've looked at Bazite or Bluefin or any of that sort of stuff that George has been doing, like it's worth looking at Vanilla because it's. I don't know. I haven't really taken the time to look behind the scenes to see who's putting all this together, but it is being orchestrated very very well. Their community manager on Discord does an amazing job of keeping people like engaged and interested. The software development, the marketing, like the artwork, the, I mean, everything is very cohesive and, and is very professional. And I don't know what their end game is. I don't know if they're going to charge for support or like what the, how they plan on monetizing this, but they're putting a lot of effort behind it and not in sort of like a community driven way, but it very much feels like a, like a corporate kind of like, here is a, you know, 
alternative operating system that happens to be based on Linux and GNOME, but yeah. there's a huge tool set built underneath of it that fundamentally alters the way you know it's run. Anyway, I, I it's in terms of when I think of like you know the composable or or you know immutable systems like vanilla's pretty high up there because of the amount of effort they're putting behind it. Yeah. And they're the same way though. They there are certain things that are just very difficult right now. But I do feel like within a few years there I'm not going to have any arguments left pretty soon. That's that's yeah. the way I look at it. Yeah. I mean, I'm you know? using, so, so jump uh, um, on now and just get used to it. Yeah. So I'm I'm using um Aurora <laughs> um on this podcasting yeah. rig and yeah. it's been a really good experience actually yeah uh, that's the kde uh, one right yeah it's the kde mm-hmm. one i tried to get yeah. bluefin working on uh one of my other devices and uh, I, I had some issues trying to dual boot it and so i gave up um because yeah. because it was a work machine so i didn't really want to blow the windows install out um i have bought some new hardware actually i uh I was speaking to a friend of mine who um, he's really uh, interested in these new Copilot Plus PCs because of the ARM chip, not because of any of the AI stuff, right. just because Me of the too. just because of the um, the battery life and stuff like that. And he bought a and he's got it now, obviously, since they've all been released now, a Surface Laptop Seven. And he was like, "This is hardware wise the closest you'd get probably to Apple level of hardware." You know, yes. that's why he reckons and. I think he's having a few teething problems because of app compatibility and stuff like that. But yes, the battery life and suspend and everything is really good. So I I was tempted, but then I was kind of like, it's a lot of money. I don't have a lot of money, number one. What, I know what I, I'm waiting for I, I, is... So, uh, so I found, I thought, well, let, if it's a hardware thing, if what, I'm, what I like is the hardware about the thing, you know, um, why not get an older Surface, which is an Intel-based one, and see what the hardware is like on that. So I managed to pick up an old um, Surface Laptop 3, I think, for about 250 bucks off eBay, which I thought was not bad. Um, and uh, the, uh, it is nice hardware, I'll tell you that. I mean, that, that was, that's a couple of years old, yeah, so I can only sure. imagine it being much better now. Obviously, it doesn't have any of those benefits as the ARM chips have, obviously, because it's still running an Intel uh, chip. But then again, I saw a... Um, a video today on youtube about how someone went on the world's longest flight which is from new york to singapore 19 hours non-stop Oof. and and uh, he used his surface along the way to do work and things that and the other and he ended the flight with 54 percent battery left yeah and you're like whoa yeah. that's 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 that's, that's game changing type yeah that's so, mac level questions experience two questions one can you get those Snapdragon processors in anything other than a Copilot system right now? And yeah. The second question being no is a short answer. Okay, and then the second question being, and from a Linux standpoint, is there any utility to those Copilot chipsets? Like, is there something that you've yes. heard about that? Okay, what have you heard? I mean, the the same. It's going to take advantage of a of a GPU on Linux, the same as it's going to take a, take advantage of one of those NPUs. So I mean, okay. it it it's a developer thing. Flip the switch, make it make it look for that kind of stuff. Um, okay. But um, but there are so they're all branded to be worked with in Copilot PCs or whatever. But there's like five or six different laptops with the Snapdragon in it. It doesn't yeah. have to be the Microsoft one. Yeah, the, okay. there's quite a few. Okay. I mean, uh, there's a there's a Lenovo, there's an Asus, there's an HP. Yep. You know, yep. there's, there's quite a few. Okay. Okay. Um, the what I found a bit odd was uh. At the Snapdragon Summit, maybe about eight, nine months ago, when they first showed off the chips, you know, uh, the X Elite and the X Pro and whatever, um, they talk about how, you know, we are baking Linux support in, you know, we're upstreaming the code that people need to do. And there was once, there was a demo of somebody running Debian on this, uh, you know, at the, you know, at Qualcomm's, you know, event. Yeah. Having said that, when people who actually now have a co-pilot PC, there's been real difficulties actually getting Linux working, apparently. Um, so there's been a couple of YouTubers who've tried and they've not actually managed to install a distro properly. And I'm, I'm talking about just, you know, the mainstream ones, you know, like the Ubuntu's and the Debian's and nobody's been able to get one working. So I would assume that it's just a question of time and a question of, because, you know, these are still very new. You know, this is 
early right. adopter territory for this technology at the minute, you know. Um, yeah, as far as I understand, the the CPU itself is supported in the kernel, but it's the yeah. stuff that surrounds the CPU that really is what's gonna what's gonna make it or break it on Linux. But that support's coming. Yeah. So, uh, so is it know, is it basically like how? Um, and I'm blanking on the project right now that is the the Linux version that is Asahi. for Apple Asahi. Asahi. Is it going to be kind of like that where there's going to have to be a specialist distribution to take advantage Less of so. the Copilot stuff? Less okay. so, um, because I don't think Snapdragon is going to be 100% mum on how these things work and how you might want uh, to integrate them in with okay. Linux, right? Yeah. App- Apple is um, a, the anti-symbiotic relationship with Asahi. They're just not <laughs> going to stop them from doing what they're doing. And, you know, if information's out there, information's out there, they're not going to stop it. But, yeah, uh, I, I, I imagine anyway. Snapdragon. Yeah, the fact that Snapdragon's already in the kernel means that I think it's going to be light years faster. Yeah, than... I think, yeah, I think, um, the, and the ones, the YouTubers who were trying to install distros were using the ARM, you know, uh, images. So, you know, the Ubuntu ARM image or whatever. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, and as you, and as I said, I actually saw, you know, there was a YouTube video of a guy at a Qualcomm event showing, here we are, here we're running Debian on this, you know, with GNOME. And so it's obviously possible. It's just not happened yet, but it will, as you said, yeah. it will happen. Um, but this this conversation is why that uh, that RADXA SBC, that, that Raspberry Pi competitor, is so appealing to me. Because it's an Intel Celeron processor. It's an x86 processor. It will work mm-hmm. with absolutely any operating system that exists today uh, in Linux, right? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's the power, way more power than a Raspberry Pi 5 uh, in the same form factor and uh, at the same price. Uh, but what, it supports what, 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 everything. What would you use it for? What was your, what's your plan for using it? As a server, everything that I use my Raspberry Pis for, this N100 would be able to do. Because honestly, the only thing I do with my Pis is I slap Docker on it, and then if there's a if there's an ARM build for that container, then it goes on there, right? That's how that works. But with the with the N100, this uh, Radza, uh, I wouldn't have to have that consideration, right? Because there's always an x86 container for it. There's always just just like um, you know. Moving from uh, you know Apple or Intel uh, Intel Mac to a an M1 Mac, right? You're just waiting for that software to get there. You're just not doing that with this N100 CPU. It's I just nice. it's it, amazing to me because I I look at projects like um, God, man, my brain. I'm sorry, guys. The what's the open hardware that the, the uh, Pine Phone Pine Pine 64, oh, right. all that stuff. And I look at like how slow the uptake on those ARM systems has been. And I think obviously because it's low powered and, you know, it's, it's not a true solution. Whereas something like these Snapdragons and the M chips are like a, literally like a, something you can pick up and run with and use like a real computer. Yeah. But it is amazing how slow that uptake has been. Do you, you think, is there any real friction? Like you're saying that the Snapdragon stuff works, th- that they're going to be more open, that it's going to be easier to adopt and stuff like that. But do you see like friction at this point? I mean, I- I'm trying to find information on Linux on these Copilot Plus systems, and there's really not much coming up for it. So yeah, I mean, bear in mind they've only been out a month. You know, people have only started. Yeah, actually come on, give people up running the Linux. Month. Yeah, you, true you know that there's people just waiting to like. F- you know, every new product that comes out, like, can I get Linux to run on it? You know, like, yeah, tinkerers. So anyway, um, I'm just curious to see because, you know, if there is this extra power, if there's this ability to run things natively, I've been doing a lot with, um, you know, large language models and AI stuff. And mostly it's been through an NVIDIA, you know, six gig uh, memory uh card and it's very limiting you know i've there's only so much you can do with that amount of gpu ram <clears throat> and i mean there are some ways that you can run things offload to cpu but ultimately like i'm picking models that you know that they're lower complexity because they can't fit into memory they can't run on this card and i'm thinking well you know it's an interesting proposition to have a pc that has specific hardware built to run these things instead of having to rely mm-hmm. specific, you know, on the GPU and the memory. Um, how, how impactful would that be with, let's say the experiments that I've been running with running stuff locally, you know? 
So there, I have an interest just based on that. And uh, yeah, I'm just curious to see, like, I would want to do it obviously using Linux and not Windows. So. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, as you say, it's just a case, I think, of uh, just seeing how, uh, you know, the, the technology develops and how, it's as you say, it's going to be much quicker than, say, Asahi, because they've had to literally re-engineer everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, yeah, yeah, you know, at some point, people will figure it out. Um, and Snapdragon have been a lot better, you know, uh, in the past and now when it comes to Linux support. Does it seem uh, like unusual or odd to you that, you know, the M series chips have been out for a few years now that all of a sudden sort of Snapdragon has a solution? Yeah. Uh, so do you think they were sort of running in parallel or? So you know? what I heard was. Reaction. No, what I heard yeah. was that, um, Snapdragon, as in the company, recently bought a... Now, did it bought by the company or did it just get the developers? I can't remember. But people who have who worked on the M-Series um, and there was some specific oh. driver support and some specific software developers. Because remember, Snapdragon has been making ARM chips for Windows. A um, while, oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, for a while. Yeah. I mean, the, f- yeah. the first one was back in what? 2012 with the first surface rt you know um, and it sucked yeah it was shit and then you know <laughs> the, the last couple of years they had the 7cx chip and the 8cx chip and they also sucked and so but, a but lot, hold on hold, that's kind of my point yeah, yeah. i want to so, 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 so this is my point that so, so the, the people so they got as i said i can't remember if it was a company or if it was just some specific developers or whatever who had done some work on the M series, which, which made it the way that it is. And that's how they've managed to, you know, leap up over the last 18 months from where they were to, you know, where they are now. There is something about that. Now, as I said, I can't remember the exact specifics. I'm sure if I searched on Google, I'll find it, but you know, yeah. there is something about, and, and the, the name of the drivers is even on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it now. Um, so there, there is something, you know, something happened which made them make this leap. That is true. Yeah, and, and I think it was it was pouring money into it and being scared because uh, Apple well, was yeah, eating everybody's lunch. Well, yeah, that's, that's okay. obviously true as well, yeah. And as I said, you know, if, if they did buy a company, well, they didn't buy it with, you know, chocolate. You know, they, bought right, it with, exactly. you know, they bought it with cash, you know what I mean? And exactly. took that intellectual they, property. They, they saw that, that Apple was filling a niche that, was, that there was a hunger for in the market. And then so Snapdragon yeah. was like, okay, we can do this too. What kind of uh, relationship are we going to have to make? And to be clear, those early Snapdragon processors didn't suck that bad. Windows sucks. Windows yeah. on ARM. Taking advantage of the There's that as well, Big yeah. Ass. So, but that has made a huge leap and bound. Um, it, it's a huge surge forward um, on, on the ARM side. And lots of software has come along with it too, right? Like a lot of the software, a lot of the technical software that I use on a Windows side now has ARM uh, versions available for it. So I think so, I think the it's right now. Yeah, and I think so it's, exci- the- it's, it's, it's it's exciting as well because it's now pushing Intel and AMD as well. And I've just I've I'm not looked into it in detail, but I've heard that you know the next generations of the chips that are coming from. Uh, intel and amd because you know they've now got some serious competition and yeah. you know they um people are talking about you know intel having to make big leaps forward as well and maybe the is it lunar lake i think the new um uh, version uh of the, well, the 14th gen 15th gen whatever of their yeah. core series um is going to be again a big leap forward and if that's true then it's exciting times to be involved in computers you know and this is yeah. what you want isn't it you want someone to do something so that it brings the whole industry uh yeah you know a rising tide lifts all boats as it were mm, we'll see so we will is this see. a case of uh, i mean apple has done this in the past where they sort of take things that have existed but put it together in a way that they only they can because they control the full stack you know hardware software is that mm-hmm. what the m series was is it was basically look We've been using ARM <clears throat> in less than effective ways. Uh, Microsoft has sort of done some things with it, but they don't really put their weight behind it and make it a good, you know, first class experience. Um, you know, can we do that? Can we solve all of these problems of battery life and thermal properties? And, you know, and, and can we make this something viable? And so they take it, package it in a way. And, and I mean, at this point, basically, 
everyone that I've heard that has an M series system really enjoys it. And I mean, there, mm. there may have been some friction at first, but I mean, it seems like by now, um, you know, this is now just the state of the art that Apple has embraced arm and is now, you know, all in on it, which is something right. Microsoft would not be willing to do. I guess you got to reverse a little bit on that because it, it's not just now that Apple is embracing arm power PC existed back then. Yeah. And it yeah. it was um that was their first attempt at going with their own chip, doing their own thing. They couldn't hack it. So they went with Intel and then languished on that hardware for a long time. And oh, now yeah. they finally got every puzzle piece in place to actually put together, just like their phones, the entire stack of a laptop. And now you can see, you can actually hear it in the people that talk about their Apple hardware how good it is compared to a Windows laptop. Like before, even when it was Intel hardware, you had people say that stuff. But now it's Apple hardware from top to bottom, and it, I think it just, it just got better. I'm very curious to try it because one of the problems I've always had, especially with their mobile stuff like a, like a MacBook, was the GPUs were usually pretty awful. They're um, pretty decent. Terms- well, that's what I'm saying. So, like, the you know, I had a MacBook in, like, 2015, 2016, something like that. You know, all Intel. It had an uh, AMD something. And it was just, it was constant. The fans were always blurring, right. you know, like, making tons of noise. Because it, it just couldn't control the, the thermal properties. Because, I mean, they were trying to make it a performant and powerful. But that was always such a huge issue. And I, I, I hated that machine because it was constantly screaming. And I, yeah. I wonder now how I would feel about a MacBook with the M series, because as far as I'm aware, like it's pretty much a, you know, silent, yeah. almost solid yeah. state type of experience. Yeah. I mean, um, if you've got, if you've got the, the lower end MacBook air, for example, the, or the entry level shop, put it that way, the entry level MacBook air that comes without a fan. There is no fan. You know, uh, it's only the MacBook pros that have fans. Yeah. And, oh, and, and the old iPads don't have fans either. So yeah, no, no, no. But what I mean right. is that you, you're right is what I'm saying. You know, cause I, I remember I had one, um, and it was strange having a computer that didn't sound like a jet engine <laughs> when I tried to do anything, <laughs> you know, or didn't yeah. burn my lap, you know. I had that me... MacBook for three months and I just, I, I was like, I can't, I can't deal with it. Like I'd be in a yeah. meeting and it would be so loud. You yeah. Know, like people would be looking at me like, what's wrong yeah. with your system? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, so I'm excited about it because I mean, first of all, I'm not going to run out and buy it. Like you said, Majid, I just don't have the you know, I can't justify spending that kind of money right now, but I love the idea of it trickling down eventually and that I can pick up, you know, and have a choice. You know, I can try the Apple stuff, which I think I probably will, but I can also now look forward to Snapdragon having a viable, you know, competitive option to that. Mm -hmm. It's that same experience because I can imagine that a Copilot Plus VC is going to perform in a similar way where there's not a, a, you know, a need for all that thermal, you know, offset and cool and all that stuff. And then the, you know, the battery life and just the general sort of compute power of, of it. Uh, I, it, I think I had just, I haven't seen any sort of a progression in hardware in such a long time, me personally. So I think this would be something if I were to delve into it, I would be pleased with the fact that it's a real jump forward, not just, Oh, there's another Intel release, you know, we put yeah, two yeah, more yeah. cores on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Woo! Yeah, cool. <laughs> a new thread ripper or whatever, you know. So yeah, cool. Well, as Bill would say, we better get out of here, folks. We've been wittering on for uh, over an hour, so uh, it's been a uh, really good chatting with you guys. It's been a while actually because I hadn't been on the yeah. last uh, LTC, and then you know, family we skipped bere- the last one. Yeah, and then family yeah. bereavements and things got in the way <laughs> and things like that, and that's uh, something that's happened to Bill as well, which is why he can't uh, be with us. And our thoughts are with him and his family. Um, so, if you have anything that you'd like to tell us, uh, hit us up on Discord, hit us up on the website Linux OTC. There's email addresses and everything on there, and all of Mastodon. our contact details. And the, yes, of course, Mastodon, because you know that's uh, that's the future. And uh, till next time, <laughs> I've still been Majid. <laughs> I will have been and always will be Eric. <laughs> there we go. And I'm still Leo. <laughs> Excellent. Have a good one, folks. <laughs>